sort of creatively would unfold. If pastel hadn't been experimented with, played with, and tried in various ways, we wouldn't be here today doing what we're doing. But there's also the artistic content of what's there, and that crosses lines. I mean, pastel isn't beautiful, the painting isn't fabulous and beautiful in a museum because it was done with pastel. It's because the artist also portrayed something. They put themselves and their soul into that piece. It's a piece of communication. It crosses borders. I mean, we have artists here that speak foreign languages. We see work that I can't communicate with the artist, but when we see that image, we feel a connection. And this is something that, as human beings, we all share. So it cuts history, culture, socioeconomics, all that kind of stuff, that we can have that. And obviously, the language barrier I was alluding to. So what I'm going to do is start over here, talk about a few pieces. We'll hop our way back around. I want to end over the master circle over there. Uh, and then run out the door. <laughs> so, I, and again, I, I'm not, I'm not passing over things for any reason, and I might pause a little longer somewhere. We'll see where the conversation goes. But I, I found this grouping really fascinating when, when you are here because what you see and it's become very popular again. I love art history. Um, I think there's so much to learn from it as we look to the future. You know, the new movements, no artist ever shows up and says, I want to be an Impressionist. We're going to create Impressionism or Tonalism or Romanticism. All the isms, as I've said, no artist says, I'm going to be an ism. <laughs> what they notice is that artists start reflecting something. And those reflections can come from their cultural environment, historically what's happening, what we become aware of. And so what, what you see in this lovely piece around the corner here is really a very quiet, tonalist impression. Then we see a much bolder portrayal, and I love paintings too. We start to know that this isn't ancient, right? This painting, there's no sign of man, see? So getting back to the imagery. I used to avoid that in all my paintings. I don't want it. Buildings and, you know, damn it, there's power lines in this scene. Now, I'm intrigued by putting them in. And they're really starting to become nostalgic. Think about it, 50, 100 years from now, people are going to look at that and go, wow, look at those power lines. Weren't they beautiful? And so I think at times we, we live too much in the moment, even when we're painting, that we don't give ourselves that ability to get in tune, you know, to say, what is the purpose in what I'm doing? You know, am, am I recording this time? Am I being nostalgic in what I'm painting? You know, gorgeous, bold use of color. We know that pastel, this really, in a way, is our more modern attitude with pastel. And that's partly based in what the pigment industries started giving pastel is. Um, but I think at the same time, I brought this up in the president's forum just a little bit, that we've become, we've become funny as a family in getting upset about the term drawing or chalk. There's chalk in all your pastels, by the way. It's an inert product. We're not using chalk, but chalk is part of it. And then they talk about, well, I hate that pastel is a reference to things delicate and, and, and that kind of soft tonal quality when you say pastel shades. And they go, what's wrong with that? You know, If the work is beautiful, the work is beautiful. But now we know that pastel can stand toe to toe with the boldest acrylic paintings, oil paintings, and some, maybe even sometimes be more brilliant because of that. I'm really intrigued by this piece because we start to recognize what it is. I, I love mystery in paintings, so this gets back to this artist's voice, I think is, is engaging us. My, one of my earliest mentors said, at the end of every painting, which kind of gave me a checklist when I was learning, she said, give, give them something. Involve them. Engage them and give them a little mystery to solve, because they'll make it their own story. Then. And I think this artist has really done this in this piece. It's so refreshing in my 50 years playing with pastel to see abstract, so I encourage you to notice, and you may have seen this in most exhibitions. I'd say even 10 years ago, it was rare to see more modern artists using um, pastel. That, and that has continued to grow. We see lots of expressions, and we'll see some as we walk around where artists um, utilize natural things, you know, flowers or even the landscape, and they'll interpret it in what I call a more modern, abstracted sense. But then you also, in these two pieces, I think you're really seeing something that speaks to that 
real abstract. You know, I go, what is it? I can look at it, and I can begin to imagine, and that goes back to that comment that I said. You know, a lot of people go, I don't like abstract, I don't understand it. And I go, well, it's not meant to be understood in a defining what the object is sort of way. If I say a rose, we all have our memories of roses, but what's exciting about abstract, and you guys know me, I'm not an abstract modern painter. I'm a romantic impressionist, as the Chinese once said. And I said, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. But what I love in abstract is it takes us back to the core of design. And if there was, in a way, a secret in painting, in, in, in the most highly realistic paintings in this show, it's abstract. So it's not. It's not that we're an abstract artist, but we have to build it. So one of my legends we're so glad to have here, you know, is Dwayne Waker. And again, Jimmy write many legends here and stuff, but Dwayne and I in conversations at time have talked about many things. Um, he knows where all the pastel bodies are buried. <laughs> but one of those comments was, we really do what abstract artists do. We start there and we build up. They take what's real and build away. So that, that excites me to see the number of, of those artists. Um, again, the modern placement within the landscape, beautiful, intriguing design. I, this probably just speaks to my character. My mother knew this real well. I believe in laws, but breaking rules is fun. <laughs> so we all learn the rules when we're painting. Right? Yeah, I've got to start somewhere. And, that, and that's something even in writing, you know, a, a classic writer will say, uh, Jack Kerouac, I once heard somebody say, I like what he was talking about, but you know he's a horrible writer because he breaks all the rules. <laughs> I thought, but is that really important, you know? So as artists, we learn these rules, like, you know, you don't take a square and divide it this way, you don't do this, but look what the artist pulled off, counterpoint. See, there's that counterpoint balance within the design and it works. So never forget in your own work. If it works, don't beat yourself up on how many rules you broke to get there because nobody, nobody cares when you fall in love with a painting. Uh, of course, Daniel Pease, we're, we're really honored to have uh, had him come to the convention this time. He had just left the uh, Preda West, uh, mentored in part of his life with uh, Richard Schmidt, the, the legend. Um, I, I heard. Colette's wonderful gallery talk. I said, wow, you really set the benchmark here. Um, far more academic. I'm more the character. You know, hands <laughs> flying, mouth going, and all that kind of stuff. But she made a comment that I thought was so beautiful about this piece, and the diversity of her awards was, it's very classic, right? We know that. And she said, there's this romanticism, but it's not sweet. And that really hung with me. Right? So for a whole day, I thought about that. And I thought, that's tricky to pull off. Right? Because I was told by a mentor once, be careful of Candyland, Richard. You're very close to painting. <laughs> Which means very sweet, you know, and like more color and more of this. And I'll put more frosting on the cake and sprinkles on top of it. Because it's fun, right? To the point where at times, joking with this artist, I said, I think I'm probably a diabetic artist. <laughs> I shot of insulin at a point. So I usually have to take some of the sprinkles off. And I, I think beyond the capability in the technique, the use of edge, lost and found edges. I mean, I could go on and on about the classicism in this piece, the focal points that the eye goes to. But to pull off that tricky thing of, it's not a cliche, in a way the subject matter is, but a painting's not, see? Think of the challenge of that. It could be romantic and sweet, but it isn't. And that's what I think really elevated this piece. I love the contemporary attitude that I'm really seeing from a lot of you artists out there now in the landscape. Uh, being somebody, I started my career very much working in a Richard Schmidt portraiture sort of way, which people don't know. I've worked in many mediums. I love it all out there in art. But when I decided 45 years ago to really go back into the landscape because that's my temple, um, it's been really fun to see people bring a more modern, again, our time attitude to a scene that we can recognize. And I think this piece really shows that really well. 
I'm really intrigued by this artist, and I was fortunate to meet him a few years ago at, at the IAPS exhibition that Shirley put on for us up in Tacoma, Washington. And as an organization, we work really hard to try to work with you societies to help come to an area, put on one of our physical shows working in collaboration. We did that up in Washington. We just did one in Chicago. And Mark is breaking so many rules. And what I love about this band puts a grin on my face. We all have, you know, is it pastel at this point? 80% under paintings. Look what Mark's doing with fabric. It's like he has found these Chinese papers and these things and he glues them down. You want to talk creativity. Here's somebody that's giving themselves permission. And as long as we're not breaking an archival law, meaning if we know we shouldn't be using this glue or this paper or these colors, you can do what you wish. You have permission. And that's a classic painting for that. Loving, again, the modern abstracts is Shirley's piece. You know, another beautiful expression. I, I see several pieces here, and I love when we see the influences of artists. We're going to get to Hala Shaki from Egypt here in the back pretty soon. Um, gorgeous loose painting right here. It's like, I want to stop talking about everything. <laughs> Shirley's going to kill me. And start his painting, but it gave him a comfortable flexibility to go more to the left or right or up or down or condense in. And as pastelists, we can do that with our surface real easy. And typically very easily trim it or contain it. And my, for the people I know that live in my area, you're gonna laugh about this. So for 30 years getting work framed, and I know the frame's gonna cover this amount or the mount's gonna cover this amount, I can never help myself. I know I'm gonna lose this. But when I go in to frame it to the framer, I'll say, you have to get that frame <laughs> right to that edge right there. And they'll look at me like, you know, you are talking about a 16th of an inch here. And I go, yes. And they go, and that's going to be custom now instead of standard. And I go, I know, but I can't sacrifice it. <laughs> so give yourself in your own creativity that permission to use space in your designs. And you can work that out a little bit in thumbnails, but you can also just start with something larger. It's very free, you know? And then all of a sudden, in my work, I'll, I'll, there'll be a certain point. I never know exactly where it is in the painting, and I'll start making marks like this. You know, I start containing the composition and adjusting what's there. Don't do it all the time, but that's a great thing. Again, art history, passionate lover. I love every movement. One of the greatest things when students or people would tell me, I know your work, I've known it for years, I can't believe you're so excited by these other things. And I, that's something I want to encourage in everybody. Don't close doors. Look at what's in front of you and say, I don't quite understand that now, but keep giving it a chance. You know, there's a moment when Mark Rothko will speak to you, you know, and, and let it happen. So that whole kind of regionalist movement in the United States, uh, from Edward Hopper, Andrew Wyatt coming into it, they were so good at creating an emotional sense in a mysterious sense that we would go, how are they doing that? You know, and it wasn't just a picture of an old abandoned building or a room. Again, it's about what they chose to compose within that design. Brian Cobble is amazing, and I, I feel very fortunate that he entered our exhibition. He lives here in Albuquerque. Um, he was at the opening with Barbara Genko, came uh, Bill Creedy's widow, and his work is you know, we could, we could say photorealistic, but it's really hyper-realism. You know, photorealism lacks a dimensional sense of space. Photorealism is one-eyed, and hyper-realism still has that sense of depth. Exquisite technique. I love that they put these two next to each other. Because, again, in a conversation with Dwayne, and I shouldn't speak for him, but he was talking about how much he adores Brian's work. And it wasn't a chance. I said, so what is it that we see in his work? And he talked about that sense of space, that everything exists within that scene where it belongs, and yet there's something kind of calm and sterile and mysterious about it, right? And so you look at this, and it all makes sense, and yet you feel that moment of Hopper, far busier, 
But it's there. I'm really excited about this piece. Um, and this speaks to diversity again. It's something, and I started with this a bit, in that I would really encourage a lot of you to get rid of that prejudice about mark making, drawing. I don't want to be compared to that uh, in pastel. Because this is the best of the both. Right? We can say it's painting. You know, I hate to bust a myth for all of you, and I can call myself a pastel painter, but it's not paint. That's, that's wet on a brush. What we're using is pigment in a stick form that we can now, thankfully, apply so that it appears much like paint and the attitude of paint. That's a good way of saying it. But we also have the luxury of mark making. And what I think is so great about this, and I know it's a self-portrait, is the freedom in the expression. You know, and that's hard to get when you're being great, to just let go and let it go. It's like dance and movement and motion. And yet there's so much accuracy and stuff in it. You know, again, very accurate, very beautiful, very sensitive, wonderful modern use of space, very contemporary, exciting color. I knew I'd end up pointing at every painting. Yeah. <laughs> Taking something we know is probably um, motivated by an organic thing, you know, fields in a flowers or something, but yet the painting is contemporary. Um, I adore this painting. Uh, and it's a bridge for some people. You know, as artists, I want you to have courage. And I know how frequently we reference Van Gogh, right? It's okay to be misunderstood in your time. You've got to remind yourself of that, about it. So, you know, people can look at it and they go, I don't understand what this artist is doing. You know, I can tell it's a tree and a field and some water, but what's going on here? And this artist reminds me, and you may know this artist's name from history, Charles Birchfield, um, again, a regionalist. But Charles Birchfield ended up painting, he loved storms, and he would paint trees, love trees. And you see this expression in the trees. And the trees would bend. And his son, they did a documentary about Charles Birchfield. His paintings now are museum quality and go for a fortune. But he said, he said, our dad would, whenever a storm was coming, he'd grab my brother and I's hand and we would stand out in front in the storm. And he said, we'd say, oh God, dad, we're getting wet and the wind's blowing. He says, just watch, watch what's here. Now, what is that message is how we need to slow down as technicians at times, instead of going, oh, I'm doing my underpainting and now I'm doing this stuff. Just be present with what's there, take that in. And that becomes part of that internal memory and that eternal emotion. And when the son was talking about it, he said, we did it over and over again. We never understood as little kids. And he said, I look at my dad's paintings now and I know how passionate he was about trying to convey the energy that was happening in those trees. So they're not hyper-realistic bed trees. He's showing force and emotion and this profound beauty in what is a dramatic storm that is threatening. And I think this artist just has it. To make a choice with leaves like this, to show this almost feminine, sensual form and motion to them, right? Thomas Hart Benton is, was a regionalist also. And uh, there's something magical about that and very creative, very creative. Again, lovely work. It wouldn't have made it in the show if it wasn't lovely work. An artist giving themselves permission to let that much of the surface show. That's permission. Most of them say, well, I can hint at a little bit of the blue sky and stuff. See, I think this is something born in us that gets killed through childhood. You know, we conform to it's, but this is the way it is. And we lose that magic. We all talk about the childhood magic. You know, if Walt Disney understood one thing, it was that magic of the child's imagination. So we paint our painting and if we, I talked about being sensitive to the scene and taking it in. I encourage all of you too to step back more often, take a breath, close your eyes and look at your painting and be with your painting and listen to your painting. And when a voice says, I like this, pause a long time <laughs> because you as pastellos have something that all wet painters don't have. This isn't going to change. Okay? So it took me, I wish I'd have known that, like 20 years earlier. But one day it occurred to me, I go, why do I feel this urgency? I like this the way it is. 
This voice over here, right? We all have it, this painting. I know y'all do. You're not going to leave it like that, are you? I like it like that. But nobody's going to understand it. They're going to think it's unfinished. But there's something excited about it. And I went, it's a pastel. It's not drying. It's not going anywhere. I can take a breath, walk away. And when I come back, I might be different. The painting's the same. Oil dries. Watercolor dries. Acrylic really dries quick. I mean, my brush was stuck half the time. <laughs> Don't forget that little secret, though, because I meant it. I wish somebody had walked up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, why are you hurrying to finish when you think there's something that might work? And I think this is one of the best examples of that. I mean, we not get know what the scene is. It would have been so easy, describing myself, to get in there and make a sky and do this. Work starts to become predictable. And that's the other comment that was given to me by my mentors, right? I'm working my head off to get technically good. And whenever you reach that threshold, like you feel like you're going to graduate, it's like, oh, wow, I'm starting to get this. They shove you one more step, right? And the guy comes up, so I got Candyland labeled, all these things, and one said, be careful of becoming predictable. Well, I, I want it to look like that. And they said, just be careful of it becoming predictable. <clears throat> It becomes boring to your audience. You know? And so uh, that freshness is something we can really have in our pastel work. So, um, let me loop around like this, and then we can go back up, and that will be the open creative impression. I mean, they're both beautiful painting. This is photorealism. Um, it shows an out of focus background the way really a camera sees. There's nothing wrong with that. I use photography. We all, photography is a magnificent tool. My advice to you is look at photography as never being a guilt thing. Um, like uh, William Truman Hosner, Bodies Books, recommend you do. He, he is the purest plein air painter I've ever met in my life, and it comes right from his heart. He doesn't do anything from photography. I'm not that guy. I love being out there. But photography calms me when I'm out there working. So I can take a dozen photographs, and I say, well, I got photographs. I can look at them later. I'm taking the scene in and working with it. And like Edgar <coughs> Payne, the magnificent California Impressionist School, the legend of that, use it. We now know through history that Renoir, Monet, even, they all used it. But these were people that knew how to use it and not abuse it, right? <coughs> so I know this because this is how the camera focuses in a depth. The human eye, if I'm looking at you, everything here and here is out of focus. And we focus on spots and move. So there's a tool. This is my <coughs> I have a guess, and I'm pretty darn sure, there's nobody here born a fourth photographer. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. I think I might win that, that guess. The point being, when you realize that I've been influenced by it, you've been influenced by it, we can't not be influenced by it. So it colors how we see, it colors how the world sees, right? You've all heard it. Your painting's as good as a photograph. They mean it as a compliment. Honestly, own that. They mean it as a compliment. Because to them, that's the pinnacle. Do you know what the response is, kindly? You yeah. say, I like to think it's better than <laughs> <laughs> So this is a beautiful juxtaposition of expressionism, use of warm and cool, and then right next to it, a classic photorealistic, <clears throat> you know, exciting floral work, beautiful classic portraiture, um, exquisite use of edges and delicacy. The juxtaposition of what pastel is capable of right next to very expressive landscape. Hala's piece from Egypt. What I love about Hala, and I've been fortunate to meet her and talk to her, um, highly educated her, uh, in London, has a great art background, very cultural in Egypt. She embraces her culture. It's beautiful. There's, at times, we can lose that identity, right? It's almost, we want to belong, so it's hammered at us. And everybody ends up painting a little bit the same. You know, I can go to China, and I'm looking at paintings that look like Monet did it. Oh, that's great, it's a beautiful painting, but I'm in China. And what I love about Hala's work, and she brings this wonderful abstract quality, is it's the patterns, the colors, the textures, the tones of Egypt. It was her, it's her culture, it's her heritage. It's around her every day, and it's expressed in her work. 
So I think that's really special. Lots of similar stuff here. Uh, and to this, and this is not, the, the frame doesn't make this piece. Oh, what a great state. Applying for an important job. I'm not going to show up in my dirty t shirt that I work in the yard in. Now, I might be brilliant, but I said, we do judge by appearance. So be aware of that in your framing. Overframe can hurt you, underframe, and this artist is using it creatively as part of their design and beautifully. This piece is so exciting and yet mysterious to us. We don't work this way a lot. But you know, again, a culture in kind of Finland and some of these places, very expressionistic. You know, munch, imagery. I don't completely understand what's here. You can read this beautiful statement, but you make out this figure in these kind of wings coming from it. There's a statement in here, and I haven't quite solved the mystery completely, but I'm so excited by it. And then the weight and the grass, I know everything, this is what I know. It's purposeful, it's expressing something, and I'm gonna figure it out eventually. <laughs> Wonderful patterns and things. So simple, it, this is warm and cool. Earth tone, right? So we get back to this color thing. Great statement. The quality of color has nothing to do with the quantity of color. Now, that's not meant at any of you that express with great color. But don't forget that color's not gonna solve anything. So the quantity has nothing to do with the quality in a painting. And because we do frame them, we think, oh, I should make that blue bluer and this, this, and this, and I go, what you present to your audience, the mind takes that frame, and that is blue, the bluest blue, that is the warmest one, or the reddest red. And it's a great experiment to work in that little bit lower key of it, that sometimes that key of, of uh, Corot, you know, and experiment with it, and you'll feel like, oh, I'm producing a more muted painting and stuff, but then when you frame it, that window, what is in front of you is presented to you. The same thing happens with value, you know, a high key painting. There's absolutely nothing in here that reaches black, or even value one on a scale of zero to 10. But we associate that dark because we see that light, and it's all we're given. So if you walked away and I didn't tell you that, and I said, so are there some really strong darks in there? Oh yeah, there are strong darks. And then you can look at something else. Don't have a good example here in front of me. But you look at something else where the artist is like Terry Ford. God, I love her work. <laughs> you know, I just love Terry Ford's work. And she's this tiny little, you know, wonderful artist. And I'm this big. I paint delicately and in that close range. And Terry's all about drawing. Get those darks darker, bolder, vibrant. You know, it works in her work. Doesn't work in my hand. Magical piece, classic paper. That's another one of the things I think as pastelists we got so excited to have sandpapers. Love them, work on them all the time. We get into making our own surfaces, do the same thing, make them, use them, love them. And when I see work of this quality, draftsmanship, gorgeous composition, and then you also read what's in here, but don't read it first. <laughs> Ask yourself, what is the artist conveying in this portrait of this older woman? How is it making me feel? What, what do I see coming across in this? And then read the statement and, and see if the artist has accomplished their goal. Um, this is master. So I'm going to hop you now back around this way. And we'll come back around here. As long as you want. There we go. Wonderful. <laughs> I love that they put these two together because you see a different style, wonderful sensitivity around the dog. You can tell that intimacy. Same thing with the cat. This is a beautiful design, use of space. Um, it would have been so easy to place the cat more classically, but that tension that's created when, as I was alluding, playing with that space. Um, that's something that I've done a lot in landscape. Um, there may be a few pieces where I could uh, target that, but it was an encouragement once, again, from a teacher I was working with that came up and they said, you know, if you would lower that down just a little bit more, and I could see what they were doing, and they said, look at that tension that's in the painting now. Or a really low horizon line where you break 
the rule, remember, I'm gonna that, put that on my gravestone. He broke a lot of rules, but he played by the law. <laughs> that third, right, we're all told, put it in the upper third of the lower. It works, right? That's asymmetry. It's classic. It's fabulous. Um, eight tenths of my work, it's there. But every once in a while, if you lower that or you raise that, you feel the emotional impact in your piece shift. So you as an artist get to go, is this conveying more how I felt when I was standing there? And these are the tools. That's where the rules can get us in trouble. We just don't think we can ever do that. So you can. Beautiful work. Wonderfully, wonderfully drawn. Gosh, how am I talking about that? Should have let me come back. I love the expressiveness of this, the delicate use of color and edge and glow in this. What a wonderful statement. I, I, don't know this artist well, but we saw their work last year on the uh, Pastelogram, the PSA publication. I've seen it now in several jury shows. And what I love about this artist's work, and, and again, we're familiar with the work, we may not have met the artist yet or visited with him, is the artist has found a series, a purpose, right? We, the medical thing, the pandemic, the mask even outside, they, this is gonna become a series that will signify in that visual way, what we've all been going through. And other artists can do it even in an abstract way of conveying the emotion of what we've all gone through and how joyous it's been to be back with our tribe. What a classic. There's so much quietness in this piece. And when you stand with it intimately, what I wanted to deposit this piece for sure is, there's such mastery and delicacy. You know, musicians know that. You know, again, I can be loud and dramatic, and some artists are meant to be that. You've got to let that voice out. But there's also so much mastery in pulling off subtlety in a painting. It's gorgeous. Another exciting piece um, shows a lot of patterns. Me and my landscape, I love a simple one like this. I hope you again spend some quiet time. You artists meant to work like this artist, this artist typically works more small, is so sensitive to their landscape where they live there. You can look at this piece and you know this person has an intimate relationship with what's there. There's no drama, no black blacks, light lights, bold colors, but you start looking at it and within almost the mundaneness of it, you find this beauty. And one of my first challenges for myself in landscape was to find the beauty in the mundane. And I went into one of the ugliest parts of Oregon in the high desert, just really brutal. Most people drive as fast as they can across that area. And I said, I'm going to spend a week here every day, just submerge myself in this sterile landscape. And the first couple of days were hard because we looked for subject matter. Right? <laughs> We look for the waterfall or the great color or the beautiful shaped tree and think those things are lovely. I love them. But the longer I kept looking, I became fascinated by that quiet intimacy of the texture. See, texture, design, the soil, the rhythm, the movement, the quietness at times, that sterility. And it became a challenge. You know, how do you take this thing that most people would never stop and look at? And here's what I found noble. The artist makes their audience, right, smell, stop and smell the roses. They're so busy that most people that walk right by that if they were out there with you on a, on a walk, but because it's a painting, they pause, and when they pause and look at it, they get that gift of being reminded of everything that's around us. And that's who you are. The greatest gift as an artist for me is not that I may sell some paintings, uh, end up with a painting in a museum or you know write a book and that, that that's nice stuff but it's the ability to communicate with somebody else to make them pause and I can be dead and gone and you say I hope somebody sits and looks at that and enjoys it so hold on to that you guys it isn't all about I got in the show I want a ribbon or anything it's that human connection I mean, this person knows how to draw. They know everything about edges, color, value, great placement, the reflection in the glasses. You know, the story starts to get, to get told. We see the people in the activity. Again, the use of space. Look at that composition. You know, all I'm sharing with you is it's like I peel this open and what's the thought process is coming out the mouth. I look at this and I went, 
I had to probably finish the hat and done this, and I'm going, look at that. So when you go to a museum, or you go to a show like this, or you buy an art book or a magazine comes, when you look at the work, ask yourself a very simple question I've challenged every student to do. If that was on my easel, how would I feel? And that's what I'm telling you here. It's like, oh, Richard, you'd have probably been more classic about it, but look what you would have lost. So in the moment, you go, oh, I won't remember that. This process that I'm going through, I won't remember it. But it becomes internal. And even years down the road, when you're painting, all of a sudden you'll go, I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to use that color. And somebody go, why, why did you choose that color? And you go, I'm not really sure. But something is telling me I should. And that something isn't something you're born with. I firmly believe it. It isn't some, oh, they were anointed. It's you've seen or been exposed to something. And it went internal, not up here. So the reasoning part, the why, I go, I can tell you why I want to pick up that fuchsia and put a mark in that green forest. Mm -hmm. And the person goes, I don't know. I say, Let's see what happens. The permission comes from what you're seeing around you in this show. So you always paint better when you go home for one of these shows. You really do. And the color and the intrigue of the square composition. These, again, are the things that are going to be historic. You, you can walk into a museum in New York and you see these paintings from the industrial time, you know, over London or even New York City and Chicago, and you see the filth and the grimy ash can school, Henry and Sloan and stuff. And they were so intrigued with that, that quality. I mean, most people, until we're given permission, Nancy King Mertz is good at this too. Mm -hmm. You know, she, what she's shown us and what Charles is showing us is the beauty in negative space and patterns and lines and stuff. I'm not going to say I think silos are beautiful, but there's this beauty. And it speaks to a definition that I cannot define for you. But I've been on this mission a long time, and I love challenging students. Define pretty and beautiful. It's very difficult. Right? It's extremely difficult. Because in the most brutal thing, there can be profound beauty. Rembrandt takes the carcass of a beef hanging on a hook. That's brutal. It's kind of the uglier side. I don't even I don't want to know about the animals I'm eating and what they go through. The painting is beautiful. You know, and if I ever crack that code, I'll give it to all of you and retire forever. I haven't quite figured it out, but it's a great mission. Um, I love what Glenn does with his work. He's another one I, I go. I, I saw his work now, it's almost becoming many years ago at PSA for the first time. And at that time, it, it, there was something so fresh and different about it. You know, we see people out at the beach, we see uh, swimmers doing things, we see these things. And when you first see that, it's like the, the, fig, the body's underwater. Right? And the first time you go, ooh, how different, how interesting. If we're not careful, again, it becomes a little predictable. But what I've noticed in Glenn, that's why I, I really stopped at this piece this time, he's still reaching, you know, and he goes back to that subject matter. He goes back to the beach and the children and whether the grandchildren or his children or the people in the area. We feel this connection to this, especially to me, a Southern California type of scene. Fabulous composition, weight, counterbalance, movement, right? Every painting has to have an entry. We enter. We enter a book. Right? Westerners, we start up here, we end here. Portraiture, that works well. You can enter up here in a portrait or a still life because it's intimate like a boat. But a landscape, you always will enter at the bottom. I didn't say it's center of interest or the most interesting part, but it's our only relationship to what's in front of us as a human is to enter it. Even if I'm looking at you, I'm walking across to you, see. that internal feeling about any landscape is important to us when we're painting because we have to allow that entry in motion into our painting and uh, this I'm a big ascent you know counterbalance movement talk to students just like the body you know if I go like this the arms got to go like that because if I try to go like this I'm going to fall over which at the, my age and what I'm going through I fall over now all the time but look at the end your hill you move up, 
even the use of the pink and violet, you come back over here, you come back down. You know, I'm paying. <laughs> Technique, fabulous. This artist has found a style, a purpose. They paint every day. They experiment. They take chances. They give themselves permission. So when you look at this, you have permission to use texture. The implication of texture without it being overdefined. Is, is that a flower? I don't know. It's a moment of red. I don't care. It's exquisite in my eye pauses there. And negative space. When, when I was teaching a lot, you know, people would drag them out somewhere to paint and they'd say, so what interested you about this? And I'd look at it and I'd go, well, you find your hook. And for me, it was, it, it really, to get personal, it really rarely is about the subject matter. Now, I love eucalyptus trees, Lombardi poplars, I'm drawn to them. But you know why I'm drawn to them? The shape and pattern, the negative space placement that those trees have in them. And when, when it took years to figure that out about, why am I attracted to this? That became easier to find my subject matter when I went inside. Because it is rhythm and texture and negative space. And you find these things, you go, look at that negative space. Look at this rhythm and motion and movement. And then the subtlety of the daylight moon, of the, you know, and you go, oh, wow, there's a lot to explore. Everything to love about Fred. Fred is the most genuine, sensitive, sincere artist, master painter, Hall of Fame PSA. And everything that Fred is in his heart, when you meet Fred, you'll know what I'm saying. No better hugger in the world. <laughs> and you, you feel this connection to one of the most beautiful human beings you'll ever meet. And then you look at his work, and that's Fred. He sees things in nature and in every subject he paints. And on his journey, he just keeps pushing to express that in what he's doing. Absolutely. Gorgeous use of color. We could talk about it for its luminosity and its color palette. It's also profoundly toned. So again, I could go on forever about this piece. I get really excited about it. I love the value range, the subject matter. To even, even again, that exquisite romance. The best tonalists, Emil Carlson, Burge Harrison, of course, Innes, they had that ability. They were reaching for something. Tonalism is not great painting. That, that's what I want to dispel. Now, there are tonalists who choose to play color down. That's by choice. But what tonalism is, is reaching for something almost spiritual in the landscape. This, this sense of air and the common relationships and things. And so they were reaching for it. It wasn't a formula. And you'll see that. And that, to me, even with the use of color, and then another piece over there that I'll use to basically say ditto about it, they pull it off. You know, and we get to experience that. If you and I were there, would we say, were those trees exactly that color and that was like that? That's what painting's about. We don't paint pictures, we paint paintings. Wonderful Mark making beautiful patterns. Judges aren't, you know, like gods up here. In jurors, they're doing the best they can. Everybody has their personal feelings about what they see. <laughs> Certain things grab us. We're excited about certain things throughout our artistic journey, so they pop up to us, we become more aware of something, we learn something. But look at a show, and don't do it in a negative, saying, I don't know why I picked that. I don't know why that won an award. Go up and be curious about it. Judge saw some merit in it. But I was so thrilled to see, this piece grabbed me the minute I walked in. You know, I, I can see this artist that just let themselves into the vines and the flowers, the permission to let these Marks with where if I just isolated that as pure abstract, it just is magical. You know, it's just magic. I mean, such a beautiful color harmony to it. Uh, so that's always rewarding. You know, if you cruise a show before you know what the award winners are, you're you're gonna get that. Maybe I had a pretty good inclination because uh, she recognized that piece. These are beautiful. This piece, Jay Z is one of my favorite artists. Uh, I love what he does with figures. Um, you know, he has an Asian background, living in Texas, physician. He expresses, he is such an expressionist. 
in his figurative work. And I hadn't seen that many landscapes until recently. And, uh, you know, this Chinese village, uh, fortunate to have been to China a couple times and kind of see this uh, deep in the woods. It is painfully abstract. Beautiful use of the paper and pastel technique. This is not on a sanded surface. And why I, I've mentioned that a couple times, and as I said, I'm, I'm really a sanded surface painter. I can paint on hard kit paper. But when the sand, when Wallace and you are, you are amazing, you know, all these papers come along, we got so excited because we always had an art to deal with, that we kind of abandoned it for a while. And I'm seeing this trend, even in this show, if you walk around and look, you're seeing more and more artists utilizing those traditional surfaces. And the pendulum is swinging, and yet the work is very expressive. Wow. Wow. You know, I mean, if, if you know Corey's work, he, classic realism, you know, it's very painterly in the fashion of paint. Uh, his work isn't photographic, and yet it's hyper-realistic in the sense of it's the way the human sees. It's the essence of when I look at you or I look at you. And he's able to convey that with the best of them. Again, the Richard Schmidts, the people. Sadly, I just heard we lost Harvey Dinnerstein on Tuesday, uh, you know, who was one of my heroes growing up, and they're falling. So, you know, build your archives of these people's work. Beautiful classic use of the gray paper. But I've seen now like four self portraits. And I, any of you that were figurative or portrait artist wise, the more you give yourself permission to get into those self portraits, something starts to happen in your work. We saw it with Rembrandt. You have no better model that you know if you allow yourself to not be the phony. And I, I, I wish he was here so I could say this to him. He's given himself permission that you feel like you know him and you know something about him. It's not just a pretty portrait of a person that has a likeness. The likeness is in the personality and the soul of what's there. So you could say, you, you said you started with portraiture, why'd you quit? I hated commissions because people want to be flattered. They want to be pleased. You aren't gonna get paid if you don't please the client. And I hated that. It took me a while to figure out, but I figured it out on the day when I desperately hoped the client would die so I didn't <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, I, I thought, this is not a good field for me to be in. You know, I'm avoiding them, I'm not answering the phone, I'm just wishing they'd go away. And I thought, I can't paint to please like that. So I'm a, I really encourage any of you, meet your clients' needs, do what you need to do to put bread and butter on the table, but give yourself, if you're a portrait figurative artist, permission to do self-portraits. You know, Chris Ivers is the that paints the dark side better than oh, Sally. Yeah. Um, the reason she's in the Hall of Fame. I love, I told Karen the other day, I've known her a long time, love her work, always loved her work. And I don't want to embarrass her if she's here, but I, I looked at her and I said, Karen, the last time we signed the book, I said, I love your piece in the show because I know you're reaching, you know? And your work before is beautiful, but you're reaching and it's exciting and it's powerful. Same thing with Adrian. I think Adrian has brought a vision about her self-portraits as well as her still lifes and teapot series of making us pause and look at something we look at every day but look at it differently. She had a wonderful use of color and value, great shapes of design, wonderful bold movement. Um, I, I Colette talked about loving the texture in Paul Murray's piece and her vision. Aileen's light, I mean, Aileen to me is like the perfect definition of an impression. You know, it's all about that halcyon feeling of light. And, uh, anyway, huge fan of Marsha, Barbara Janicki, oh my God. Snow, not the easiest thing to paint because it can either look really plastic um, or we can go too far in pushing the color. And that's where I always got in trouble. The snow became too pink, too blue, a little too much green. I always avoided yellow snow. <laughs> I was able to say this to Andrews because I've known his work, admired his work a lot. 
And Andrew falls in the category that I'm going to be concluding here with just an encouragement to all of you because it's what I have to remind myself about continuing our artistic journey, pushing ourselves. Working in various mediums for a time and then coming back to pastel, you actually become a better painter because you start to learn that the secret is not that I'm using pastel. I'm actually producing a painting and I can use any medium. Margaret Morier, my mentor, looked at me one day, and it's a long story, so I won't go into it, but it was an artist that didn't have the tool they needed to finish her painting. And she looked at me and she said, Richard, I want you to remember this. If you don't have a brush, you should be able to paint the painting with a popsicle stick. Because the brush isn't the secret to the good painting. And that that and, and Andrew's really going somewhere with his street scenes and what he's brought to it and his figurative work. Just so exciting. Uh, Lynn's work, uh, I think especially going back to Maine, we've seen, if you know her work, in the years now that she's moved back to that area. Not that her work wasn't beautiful before it was, but I think her soul is more here. This little gray portrait by Michelle Ashby from uh, England or Scotland, anyway, somewhere in the British Isles, amazing artist. I encourage you to read this statement. And work can move us in two ways, as I, as I finish up here. There are paintings, and I think Wyeth is a bit like this for me, where the imagery, what their subject matter is, what they choose to use in that, how they position it, moves us, stops us. Right? You, know, you, you think of Wyeth's Christina's world, or the window with the curtain, and Michelle making a choice here. Uh, the, you know, slightly aging, beautiful woman, the position of the hand, the looking up, but yet the eyes closed, and then to choose to only do it in black and white. And it was so intriguing. Now, she's obviously could do anything she wants with pastel, but it's not the mark making. It's not the bold use of color. Those things are glorious in somebody else's hand. But it's the image that you stop and pause, and then having the ability to read the artist's purpose you start connecting the dots. So I encourage you to take a moment and read that. I could go on and on about Anna Wainwright. I mean, I, I met Anna when she was first working with an artist that was a very dear friend of mine uh, back east. And she introduced me to, to Anna. And if Anna was here, I'd, and she knows, we can cry about losing this lady. She was a magnificent lady in art. And she looked at me and she said, Anna's kind of new to some of this. But I think there's something so deep in her that as she finds her techniques, and as she works with all your different pastel artists and tries emulation, right? America suffers with, we're so, well, many things, God, we won't go there, but <laughs> Indep this independence, this profound sense of no one wants to be compared to anyone else. Oh, I can tell you work with so-and-so. And it's, to us, this insult. Now, in Asia, that's the opposite. The homage to the master. Oh, my God, you think my work even comes close to theirs. But to us, it's this, I'm me. I don't want to be compared to them. But when you work with somebody, emulate them. Take it all in. Digest it. It's like following that chef's recipe. I'm going to master the technique of this. I'm going to get a tactile feeling for it. I'm going to maybe work with an artist who I love their imagery. And it's going to open up windows and doors into possibly how I could use atmosphere or how I could use bold colors. And then you say, I've got that. I understand the process. I understand the technique. Now I'm going to sing my song. There's abs. Don't ever be ashamed of emulation. Don't ever get upset when somebody comes up to you and says, and I heard this for years, it's a fabulous compliment. I can tell you worked a lot with Handel at one period. I go, damn right I did. <laughs> when I first saw him paint, and I watched the hand, right? We love Albert, but would you think Albert, the character, this sensitive movement with this hand? And he didn't have to speak a word. And I watched that, and all of a sudden I went, I found our mission. I've always wanted that. So I just emulated and we keep great friends we painted together and then more and more I'd say all right I'm gonna let more of my own voice out 
And uh, so I encourage you to do that. Anna's voice is right there, and that is who she is. There's great work here. I, I love what Brian does in his expression, Tatiana. Uh, Laura's beautiful use of color and abstraction and luminosity in her work. Uh, Sandra Michelle from New Orleans. But, and this is not about arguing with the judge, but that's one of my favorites. I love her work. I love working <laughs> with her. We're curating more shows. You guys have heard us in the prospectuses talking about that. I was fortunate to work with her last year around this and, and several artists this year. And it's so nice to sit down and have a conversation. Like, what do you see in this piece? And they start explaining these things like I'm doing, it opens up a veil for you. This would have been my pre of show. Okay. And I think it, it, for some artists, it's a piece that they're maybe not that comfortable with that much atmosphere. Or that, again, what I call tonalism quality. And I adore her work. And I know her work. And I've been appreciating it and kind of um, kind of peeking to see you know, where she's going and what she's doing with great admiration. But wow, stuff like this just kills me. I mean, I, I went, this is color space painting meets simultaneous contrast meets luminosity in this, these landscapes I'm talking. I guess maybe as I'm aging and dealing with crises in life, I, this kind of peacefulness to it, right? You know, that Midwestern peacefulness. And um, that's all I can say. I, I, I just adore this piece. Now, now I'm gonna make her laugh. I, I almost tried to finagle a way to say, I will sponsor an award, you print a certificate, because I want everybody, I'm just encouraging you, I'm not saying call it. I want you to love this piece because it's different and look what Pastel can do. You've seen it on display. You've seen multiple voices creatively expressed. But who would have thought 20 years ago that you could look at a painting like this and say, that's Pastel? And it's Pastel. So go enjoy. Have a All of the locations where there are pastel societies in this International Association of Europe, Canada, Asia, wow, that's a lot, New Zealand, Australia, and of course the U.S. Look at that. So I finally get to come in here and see the show and sign my name on the board. Yay. I was here.